Hi, everyone. Welcome. This is Challenging Anti-Blackness for Collective Liberation, part two with Maya Fino. I'm going to give everybody a few minutes to log on in the chat. If you want to go ahead and share where you're from, we would love to know. Welcome, everyone. All right. It's great. I think we'll give everybody a few minutes to tune in. Also, make sure when you're in the chat, there's a blue bar that says everyone and hosts and panelists or a specific person. If you want everyone to be able to see your message, make sure it's set to everyone. Otherwise, it's just going to be us behind the scenes seeing your message. Uh, so feel free to, to change that in the toggle. Yes, part one was last semester, Open EDU, spring 2022. Um, they build upon each other, but if you haven't watched it, don't worry. You're going to be able to follow along just fine and then kind of look back on part one, which is on our website as a prequel, sequel, add-on. You know, it's, it's, it's all good if you missed it. So welcome, everyone. This is going to be an amazing, amazing class. If you've ever had the pleasure of hearing Maya speak, they kill it every time. It's really, really going to be special. Okay, we'll give everybody a few more minutes. Okay. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Here we go. Hey, wonderful. I think one more minute and then we can press go. Okay, some general housekeeping also. Um, if you need closed captionings, it's in the bottom right. There should be a CC there. You just press enable closed captions and you'll be able to see um, you know, the captions on the screen. Please put all questions in the Q&A section, which I think is just right next to it in a Q&A section. Sometimes the questions get lost in the chat. So it's just easier for us to be able to look at everything at the end there all in one place. And we do hold space for questions at the very end of class. But we love y'all to be active in the chat in the meantime. And for anyone who missed it, just feel free to change the toggle down to everyone instead of just hosts and panelists so everyone can see, um, you know, your chat. And without further ado, I'll let Maya introduce themselves and take it away. Thank you guys so much for being here. And yeah. Thank you, Nicole. Hi everyone, my name is Maya Fino. I use they, them pronouns. Um, if you don't know me, I'm a fat, black, queer, non-binary cultural worker, writer, model, and political educator, born on occupied Ino Okanichi land, also known as North Carolina. Um, I'm currently based on Lenape land, AKA Brooklyn, New York. I'm the child of West African immigrants who came to this nation in the 1980s. So the majority of my maternal ancestors were the first peoples of the land now known as Sierra Leone. Um, I come from the Shabro, Mende, and Kono people. I wanna thank you all so much for taking the time out of your day to learn with me for just a little bit. We'll be spending the next hour together deepening our understanding of how anti-Blackness manifests in the world around us by examining three different systems of oppression. Next slide, please. So this class is for participants who attended part one, or who already have a deep knowledge of the history of systemic anti-Black racism. Part two will dive deeper into the ways anti-Blackness is a foundational aspect of settler colonialism, anti-fatness, and patriarchy. 
we will examine these three axes of oppression so that we may engage in our multifaceted liberation movements with a full understanding that without Black liberation, we cannot achieve collective liberation. We're gonna be moving through a lot of content today. So I hope that you all take what you learn in this conversation, look at the further reading list that I'll be sharing afterward and do your own research and study as well. And very briefly before we start, I said this in part one as well, but I just wanna acknowledge that anti-Black violence is a difficult thing to discuss. It affects me personally. Um, and we'll also be talking about settler colonialism, anti-fatness and patriarchy today too. So I just ask that all the Black folks in the room prioritize your body wisdom, be unapologetic about leaving this space if you need a breather. And if you decide that you just wanna review the recording that'll come out at a later date, I wholeheartedly support that. Thank you. All right, next slide, please. Okay, now let's dive in and start with actually a recap of some of the major takeaways from part one, which served as an introduction to anti-Blackness. So hopefully this will be helpful for folks who haven't been able to watch part one yet. Okay, so I wanna refresh folks' memory and start by defining Blackness as a racial category. As I said in part one, note that Black people have self-defined Blackness to mean a variety of things, including resistance, rebellion, community, and joy. But for the sake of understanding anti-Blackness, we need to look at Blackness as defined by white supremacists and white capitalists. So can I ask Nicole to please read this quote out loud? Blackness is a capacious strategy essential to an array of political economic functions in, sorry, let me move this, including accumulation, dis disaccumulation, debt, planned obsolescence, and absorption of the burdens of economic crises. At the same time, Blackness is the quintessential condition of disposability, expendability, and devalorization. That's from Modern U.S. Racial Capitalism by Dr. Sharice Burdenstelli. Thank you so much. Okay, so lots of big words in this, but I really want to for the big takeaway from this to be that you understand the contradictions within this definition. So blackness is essential to an array of political economic functions, but at the same time, black people as a whole are largely considered disposable and expendable in this world. Next slide, please. So to elaborate on the quote that we just saw, it's important to note that forced black labor has been essential to the building of many Western European empires. You can just look to the colonial histories of the British, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the French, and the Dutch. At the same time though, we've seen so many laws and policies for hundreds of years globally dedicated to treating black people as subhuman and disposable. I define anti-Blackness as an ongoing systemic violence against Black people that is rooted in racial hierarchy and the false narrative of Black inferiority. So anti-Blackness is like this ongoing legacy of the atrocities of slavery. And because of white supremacist racial hierarchy and the idea that Blackness as a racial category was formed in opposition to whiteness, all non-Black people can engage in anti-Blackness. I spoke extensively about this in part one, that slavery and colonization needed foot soldiers and the myth of black inferiority helped get poor and working class white people in line because you're more inclined to commit violence against someone that you don't believe is human and you don't believe feels pain in the same way that you do. Also non-black people of color have upheld the ideology of anti-blackness at various points in history because they themselves have internalized the belief that black people are inherently inferior to them and or they recognize that distancing oneself from blackness can offer more socioeconomic privileges. And finally, to bring this section to a close, a reminder that we have to flatten our various, that we must refuse to flatten our various racialized experiences for some false sense of unity. And we have to instead organize across differences. Anti-blackness is something that has to be unlearned so that trust can be built. Emphasis on built. <laughs> Solidarity is a living, breathing thing that has to be nurtured from the ground up. Also, solidarity is not quid pro quo. You don't do it so that you can get something back. The goal should be that we organize in principle struggle with one another, um, acknowledging that the fact that we have different realities and that mistakes will be made along the way. But solidarity is an ongoing commitment and journey. Okay, that's all for major takeaways. The next three sections will dive deeper into the ways that anti-Black racism manifests and is amplified through other systems of dominance. So first, 
We'll be examining how anti-Blackness is essential to settler colonialism and why Black African indigeneity needs to be uplifted more in our ongoing movements against colonialism. Afterward, we'll look at the anti-Black origins of fat phobia and talk a bit about how fat, the fat liberation movement must be rooted in Black liberation too. And then we'll get to racialized gendered violence and Black feminist resistance throughout the history of the United States. After that, we'll conclude and hopefully have a bit of, a bit of time for a Q&A discussion. So in this first section, we'll push back on popular assumptions about settler colonialism and critique how Black Africanness is often stripped of indigeneity. So I'll be primarily focusing on two texts. Decolonization is not a metaphor written by Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang, and also a critical critique of it called Slavery is a Metaphor by Tapchi Garba and Sarah Maria Sorrentino. So if you haven't already, I think it's really worthwhile to sit down and take your time reading both these texts, but I will be summarizing and working through them today. So don't worry. Decolonization is not a metaphor, it is circulated often in academic and organizing spaces as a foundational text. Personally, I'm not against the main goal of decolonization is not a metaphor and trying to get us from moving away from casually throwing around the term decolonize for things that have nothing to do with the actual project of decolonization. I'm sure many of us in this room have seen things like decolonize your diet or like decolonize your bookshelf, you know, using this very intentional political language for individual actions that don't actually do any movement organizing or push the movement forward. And honestly, I don't think that Garba and Sorrentino, Sorrentino the authors of uh, Slavery is a Metaphor, would disagree entirely with the main argument and demand of Tuck and Yang either. The main points of contention that I'll speak to today are really with how one, Tuck and Yang ignore how metaphor is actually really necessary to fully understand the role of slavery and crafting much of the socio and political realities of this world, especially post 1492. Um, and two, Tuck and Yang's theory that settler colonialism is made up of a triangle relationship relationships between the settler, the native and the slave is not sufficient enough. And in some ways it treats black people like an afterthought. But first, before we move any further into this critique, let me get into an explanation of that triangle of relations, the settler native slave triad right now. And so we have, next slide please, a visual that hopefully is helpful um, in explaining the theory. So as I was saying, Tuck and Yang theorized that settler colonialism can be described as an unbalanced triangle of relationships between the settler, the native, and the slave, and all these elements make up settler colonialism. It was very hard to do an unbalanced triangle, but I tried to do my best. As you can see, the settler is at the top. Historically in the US, like we envision this, this position and this role as primarily held by white cis men. And so some of the characteristics of the settler under settler colonialism are violent expansion on stolen land, the genocide and the exploitation of chattel slave labor. Like the settler also is the owner of property, the land and the category of human, quite literally humanity. Um, also, we have the native at the bottom in the US, this is primarily indigenous folks and some of the characteristics in their settler colonialism are genocide at the hands of settlers, forced removal and relocation and also historical erasure with the attempt to render indigenous people completely invisible. Finally, we have the slave also at the bottom. In the US, this has primarily been displaced black people. Um, the slave is seen as non-human by settlers. The slave is landless, also quite literally properly, property that is owned by the settler, a stolen and forced laborer on stolen indigenous land. So please keep this triangle in mind because now we're gonna move into some complications and critiques of it. So I found this to be one of the most powerful quotes from Slavery as a Metaphor. And can I ask Paloma to come off of you and read it out loud? Within the conceptual apparatus of decolonization is not a metaphor. Slaves are stuck in a treadmill of both political indecipherability, both victims and antagonists, essential to the clearing of land and inessential to its return. That exemplifies the violence of slavery itself. And that is an excerpt from Slavery is a Metaphor by Tapshi Garba and Sarah Maria Sorrentino. Thank you so much. So while Tuck and Yang start out decolonization is not a metaphor expressing that there's like this triad, triangle of relations that make up settler colonialism, 
over the course of the article, this triad disappears and the position of the slave is placed somewhere between settler and native, both an antagonist and a victim. Next slide, please. I thought a visual reference would be helpful for folks, like try to do a binary that's still expressed if the settler holds power. Um, so Tuck and Yang describe enslaved Black people acting as antagonists that aided settlers in the clearing of indigenous land. But at the same time, they also weren't considered free or even human because the slave is still a victim, still property. So that unequal triangle we saw earlier flattens into a binary. It becomes clear by the end of Tuck and Yang's decolonization is not a metaphor, is that Black people descended from the enslaved and stolen Africans brought to the United States are inconsequential to a decolonized future in the Americas. Even though Black people descended from enslaved Africans were violently displaced from their indigenous African heritages and slavery is supposed to be an essential part of settler colonialism, slavery gets demoted by the end of decolonization is not a metaphor to a phenomenon that's almost derivative or byproduct of settler colonialism. And so here on this binary, I still have some of the same characteristics for the settler and the native, but I added a bit for the chattel slave now we're now somewhere in the middle, like existing somewhere in between settler and native, both victim and antagonist, essential to settler expansion, but inessential to decolonization. So next slide, please. So if I can summarize the previous slides, I would say that Tuck and Yang contradict themselves. Although they initially say that there's a settler native slave triad that makes up settler colonialism, by portraying black people as both victims and antagonists, they imply that it's actually a settler native binary in which black people sit somewhere in between. Honestly, I think that this triad just isn't worth using because both the position of the slave and the native get complicated when you view settler colonialism through a lens of blackness. Also, that settler native slave triad explanation of settler colonialism can't be universalized. I think it falls apart further when you think about the slaveholding of the five tribes, the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Creek, and the Seminole. Indigenous slaveholding of displaced Africans in the United States makes the power relations between the native and the slave unequal in a way different from the binary that Tuck and Yang were getting at. Also, settler colonialism on the African continent was uniquely shaped by the system of chattel slavery. Africans occupied the position of native, were then displaced to become slaves somewhere else. Also, the transatlantic slave trade of Africans fueled the colonial domination of Africans in their native lands. Like, I'm, my family's Sierra Leonean. Sierra Leone was a British colony created with the intent of having a place in West Africa to put freed Black people from the Caribbean, the Kenda, the United States. Like, the capital of my country is literally called Freetown. Um, Finally, like if slavery is fundamental to settler colonialism, which I believe it is, it's anti-Black to be anti-metaphor because we need metaphor to really describe how critical both slavery and what the slave symbolized was to the making of our current world order. And here's what I mean by the symbol of the slave. As disturbing as it is to think about, enslaved Black people literally symbolized wealth and colonial expansion in the United States. The ability to own a slave meant that you had the money to buy and exploit chattel because that's what black people were viewed as chattel. The chattel could then farm and harvest cotton, tobacco and sugar cane for you. You could use these exploited slaves to forcibly clear indigenous land for your new plantations. The plantation, plantation slavery economy literally built the United States. Um, so yeah, actually metaphor as a linguistic tool for symbolism is actually really necessary to grasp the full and total impact of chattel slavery in our world. So I'm gonna read this one out loud. The Colombian expedition would not have been possible without the inauguration of slavery earlier in the 15th century. The position of the slave was both materially and symbolically significant for the reification of Africans as the quote, legitimately the only legitimately enslavable population enabled the emerging discourses of republicanism and civic, civic humanism and thereby searched the moral and philosophical foundations of post-1492 polities. And this is an excerpt from Slavery as a Metaphor as well. So when we cast off or deny symbolism, we'll always struggle to accurately and historically describe the state of the world since the early 1400s. Metaphor is necessary because we can't only discuss chattel slavery as simply forced labor that helped build colonial, settler colonial empires. We have to be thorough in our analysis and also name how slavery was symbolically significant. 
how the debates and discourses about slavery led us to now. Like these debates were on topics like, are Black Africans human? Do Africans have souls? Like Africans are perfectly suitable to slavery for these reasons. Like all of those discussions led to the formation of white racial hierarchy, led to the dehumanization of Africans so as to justify their enslavement, and also led to so much of the government formations that still impact us today. Like if you live in the United States, you know that the US constitution has a whole three fifths compromise that was meant to limit the electoral power of Southern states. Of, this was overruled by the 14th amendment, but there was a discussion fueled by slavery about how much should slaves be worth in this document. <laughs> this debate resulted in the three fifths compromise at that 1787 constitutional convention and unfortunately helped create the US constitution. So all that to say, to be anti-metaphor, to be anti-symbolism really, is to, to quote from Garba and Sorrentino, to refuse to reckon with slavery's role in rendering the emerging conceptions of God, globalization, humanity, politics, history, and economy coherent for the purposes of capitalism and conquest. So this map on the right, I know it's kind of small to see, but it's from, it's like European map of Northwest Africa um, from a 1535 atlas. But you can see a few historical dates and they're telling us a bit about how Portuguese sailors and colonizers reached the coast of Sierra Leone by the 1460s. To be clear, Christopher Columbus, we hate him, horrible, was unfortunately directly inspired by the Portuguese and also the Spanish navigators who were sailing down the West African coast in the late 1400s, trying to find trade routes to Asia, but who were also starting to build forts and castles along the Western coast of Africa and started capturing slaves, um, Africans for enslavement. So when we refuse to be anti-metaphor and instead commit to an accurate analysis of slavery and anti-Blackness in our movement building, we open the door for decolonization to have more expansive possibilities of freedom and autonomy. Of course, there are issues with the whole idea of reparations in the United States for Black people being 40 acres and a mule on stolen land, absolutely. But also, let's be real, that dream was dashed away pretty quickly for Black people post-emancipation. Um, and the role of the position of the slave as landless property and the forced removal also of Indigenous Africans with ties to the land from their homeland has forced Black people in the United States to have really creative visions of liberation and freedom beyond land. Black people have had to find other ways to make freedom, other ways to work towards the abolition of Western hegemony. Next slide, please. So ultimately, you can't talk about settler colonialism or the project of decolonization without talking about chattel slavery, because chattel slavery and anti-Blackness are essential to the onset of settler colonialism. They are not derivative or byproducts of settler colonialism. But Thank you. But this also leads me to another question. Why are Black Africans still largely left out of global discourse on indigeneity? So we see this photo here. It's of Ken Sarawiwa, who was an indigenous African environmental activist and writer who dedicated his life to advocating for the protection of the ancestral lands of his people, the Ogoni, in the Niger Delta region of Niger Nigeria, the land now known as Nigeria. He co-founded the organization Movement for the Survival of the Ogoni People, which still exists today. He, alongside other Ogoni people, primarily organized against the devastating impacts of environmental pollution in the Ogoni homeland. This devastation was led by big oil companies, including Shell in the 1990s. And he called the actions of Shell and other multinational corporations in the region, quote, ecological war against the indigenous Ogoni people, end quote. Ken Sarawiwa was executed in 1995 after a special military tribunal created at the hands of Nigeria's then military government because they falsely accused him and eight other Ogoni environmental activists of murder. And they are collectively known as the Ogoni Nine who were executed. So although Shell continues to say that it had no part in colluding with the Nigerian military on the assassinations of the Ogoni Nine, Shell paid a 15.5 million settlement in 2009 to some of the families of the victims. So just come to your own conclusions about Shell. Um, I bring up Ken Sarawiwa because commonly circulated, can we go back please? Thank you. 
Commonly circulated statistics stating that indigenous peoples make up only 5% of the global population don't really include any black Africans. These limiting statistics ignore the campaigns against neo-colonial forces and corporations like Shell, the victories and the assassinations of indigenous African water protectors, land stewards and environmental activists. And I think it's high time we stop doing that. So including black Africans in both global indigenous studies and discourse on indigenous activism does not take away from the geographically unique experiences of non-black peoples who are indigenous to the Americas, Asia, um, Australia, the Pacific and beyond. And of course there's indigenous people in Europe as well. It actually creates the space for more points of building unity and organizing across difference. So reframing global indigenous sovereignty so that it recognizes Black Africans allows us to see that while material decolonization of the land is an absolute necessity, there's also the spiritual work of like rematriation that is necessary too. Like, for example, what are what do reparations for harm against people of the African diaspora really look like? Reparations for the ways that displaced Black people um, in the diaspora were violently disconnected from sacred traditions and genealogies. I don't have the answer to those questions. But more conversations about decolonization that include Black African indigeneity might lead us to them. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to shift now into our next section. This one will explore how fat phobia is inherently connected to the need of Western European colonizers to control and dehumanize the bodies of people of the global majority, most specifically the bodies of fat Black women. So I'm defining anti-fatness here, but we'll probably use anti-fatness and fat phobia interchangeably throughout this presentation. There's not much difference in my mind between the two because most critical fat study scholars use both as well. If anything, the term anti-fatness just sort of speaks to more of the structural and institutional violence of hating fat people. Okay, so anti-fatness can be defined as the attitudes, behaviors, and social systems that specifically marginalize, exclude, underserve, and oppress fat bodies. And thank you to Aubrey Gordon, um, also known on the internet as your fat friend for this definition. So there's statistical evidence that anti-fatness has serious consequences on the livelihoods of fat people. There's hiring and employment discrimination because the only US state that has legal protections against weight discrimination is Michigan in all other 49 states in the United States, there's no clear pr legal protections against anti-fatness, so you could technically get fired because you're fat. There's also, of course, medical fat phobia in which fat people experience health disparities because doctors misdiagnose. So for example, a fat person can have cancer and it's concerned because they're losing a bunch of weight, but a doctor might say to them, oh no, it's good that you're losing weight, keep it up. And the doctor do won't run the tests that are needed to catch the cancer early. So by the time this fat person is finally diagnosed after being neglected and dismissed for a while, the cancer is at their point terminal. Like that's an example of medical fat phobia. And of course there are the individual fat phobic sentiments that fat people experience. The bullying and harassment of fat children and adults um, is for the most part socially acceptable in our world. So while anti-fatness is not actually rooted so anti-fatness is not actually rooted in concerns about health or wellness. It is really about the white supremacist idea that your appearance and the assumptions made about you simply from your appearance determines your value within society. Okay, so now that we have this definition in mind, let's get into how anti-fatness is actually rooted in anti-blackness. So up until the early 1500s in Europe, what some would consider, I guess, the high Renaissance period, Thinness in many parts of Western Europe was actually still seen as sickly. This changed with the establishment of Western European settler colonialism in the Americas of, and of course beyond, and also the booming of the African slave trade. So you now started to have the arrival of extracted foods that changed European diets and also enslaved labor started arriving in Europe too. So there's this increased proximity to people who need to be seen and easily identified as the enslavable population. So you will need some markers to separate slaves from those who, who are now becoming white um, to keep them separate. So we started to see by the late 1500s and the early 1600s, like more Western European writers and even philosophers starting to say that being fat 
it is signed of being like empty headed, obtuse, like other ableist terms. Um, and they even started demonstrating the belief that fatness is a barrier to achieving intellectual enlightenment. So Shakespeare, for example, you know, the famed English playwright has a character in one of his plays uh, named Sir John Falstaff, and I guess Henry IV, whose fatness is written as one of his negative qualities. And like that shines through in the way that other characters talk about his fatness too. Also during this time, there was like the ever present Christian element of the sin of gluttony that must be avoided at all costs. So all of this set the stage for race scientists in the late 17th century to find new ways for classifying humans via a right racial hierarchy. Fatness soon became a justification for a European subjugation of the global South. For example, like the overindulgence of Africans, as they say, proves that they can't govern themselves. So by the late 1600s into the 1700s, we started to see racial scientific literature like openly proclaiming that there were connections between the quote, lazy, gluttonous, like ignorance of Africans and their fleshy bodies. So to summarize, in order to distinguish themselves from those who they deemed as racial others, Western Europeans work to create a global standard of what is a beautiful and good body that is predicated on both whiteness and thinness. Body types that didn't fit into the supremacist standard were pathologized and seen as undesirable and deviant. So this image that we see here, like it shows French noble people like really scandalized at the sight of a fat black African woman who's basically put on display in front of them. Um, and this woman is Sarah Bartman, and we're gonna pivot to learning a bit about her now. So one of the most disturbing, upsetting and heartbreaking examples of how Western Europe used fatness to justify violence against Africans has to be, in my opinion, Sarah Bartman. So Sarah Bartman was a Khoikhoi woman born in what we now call South Africa. I'm using the only name that I know to refer to her because the name, or names that she would have been called by her family or and community are not known to us at this point. Um, she was taken to Europe by two white men in 1810 where she was paraded, exhibited and hypersexualized as a freak show attraction in Great Britain and France over a five year period um, due to her physique, which Europeans found quote exaggerated or over exaggerated. Um, they called her the hot and top Venus, like hot and top was a derogatory term used to describe the Kokoi people during the Dutch colonial era of the region. Even after her death in 1815, she continued to be exploited. Um, her remains were dissected by European scientists and her skeleton and body casts were on display at the first at first at the French Museum of Natural History in Angiers, and then moved to the Paris Museum of Mankind in 1937. So her remains were on display for over 150 years until 1974. And her body was not returned to her homeland and buried until 2002. Sarah Bartman was one of many black African women dissected and dehumanized by the race scientists of this era who wanted to justify white racial hierarchy by proving the inferiority of the savage, quote, savage bodies of black Africans compared to the civilized Western or Northern European ones. And at this point, fatness became associated with blackness. So while all this violently fat phobic and anti-African sentiment was getting thrown around in Europe, some scholars like Dr. Sabrina Strings believe that fat phobia as a concrete, consistent ideology did not come into being until the early 19th century, actually, with the help of all the socio-political events happening in the United States. And I agree with her. Could I ask Celine to read this quote out loud? Yes. Racial scientific rhetoric about slavery linked fatness to greedy Africans, and religious discourse suggested that overeating was ungodly. Not until the early 19th century in the United States, in the context of slavery, religious revivals, and the massive immigration of persons deemed part Africanoid, did these notions come together under a coherent ideology from fearing the Black body, the racial origins of fat phobia, Sabrina Strings. Thank you so much. 
So by massive immigration of those deemed quote Africanoid, we're talking about the Irish, Southern and Eastern Europeans who are arriving at this time. Um, also because the United States is in so many, so many ways the brainchild, brainchild of Western Europe that loves to go the distance when it comes to oppression, this coherent, coherent ideology of fat phobia continues to run rampant in this country. But luckily for us, so much of fat liberation is organizing and resistance has sprung out of the United States too. Thank you. So hopefully at this point, everyone in the room grasps that anti-fatness in the United States is not rooted in the medical field, but it instead springs out of anti-Black pseudoscience. Um, and because the origin of fat phobia is so tied up in anti-Blackness, fat Black people continue to bear the brunt of anti-fatness in the United States. And this is evident in both media and police violence. Like, I'm not going to even get into it deeply, but if you know who Lizzo the musician is, then I'm sure you also know that every few months, like clockwork, there is some celebrity or podcast bro who finds a way to sling fat phobic hate at her for simply existing as a fat Black woman. Um, it could be as simple as her posting a picture of herself in a bikini and that snowballs into days and days of racist and fat phobic discourse about her size. It's ridiculous. Um, I also think it's important to bring up police violence because fat Black people are brutalized by the police and their fatness is used as justification for the harm committed against them. So there's the somewhat well-known case of Eric Gardner who was murdered by the NYPD in 2014 after being put in a chokehold that of course cut off his oxygen. Um, and I also wanna uplift the lesser talked about story of Kayla Moore, who's a black trans woman living with schizophrenia. She was murdered by Berkeley police in 2013. Um, her roommate called 911 because she was experiencing a mental health crisis. And instead of support and care, she was brutal, brutally restrained by police to the point of her death. So both Eric Gardner and Kayla Moore were fat black folk who had police imply that their fatness was the reason for their deaths rather than the police officers who suffocated them. And as a fat black person myself, like I have a clear stake in organizing towards a world without police for many reasons, including the fact that I and other fat black people deserve to exist safely without criminalization at the hands of the police. So the contemporary fat liberation movement, which finds some of its history in queer, feminist, and Black freedom struggles of the 1960s and 70s, calls, calls on us all to openly declare that fat people deserve humanity and to exist with dignity. Also, fat Black liberationists like Hunter Shackelford have reminded me that because of anti-Blackness and anti-fatness are so intertwined, you can really say that fat liberation was sparked the moment the first enslaved Black person revolted against captivity, and that fat liberation really starts at the beginning of Black resistance. And I think Hunter said at some point that fat liberation started on the first slave ship. So next slide, please. Thank you. So here we have the Fat Liberation Manifesto. I know it's too difficult to read. Uh, there's gonna be a quote on the next page. Um, it was written in 1973 and came out of radical fat, a radical fat organizing collective called the Fat Underground, predominantly made up of queer feminists. This manifesto, which I would argue still resonates with many fat liberationists today, is an attempt to put in the words, um, all of the systematic violence, stigma and hate that is so normalized against fat people. Um, besides the brilliant takedown of the billion dollar indus diet industry and medical fat phobia at the hands of doctors, I think one of the most important aspects of this manifesto for everyone to know is the third point. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Also, I will put this manifesto in my further reading list, but, and I'll read this out loud. So we see our struggle as allied with the struggles of other oppressed groups against classism, sexism, classism, racism, sexism, ageism, financial exploitation, imperialism, and the like. And this is an excerpt from the Fat Liberation Manifesto. So I hope you understand that fat liberation is not body positivity or body diversity. Like it's not something that centers only around an individual. It's about collective liberation for all fat people globally. And because we all live multi-issue lives, we're to Audre Lorde, in order for all fat people to be free, all systems of oppression must be dismantled as well. 
Okay, so so much of this section has been about explaining the violent exploitation that that like people have experienced at the hands of Western Europeans and white Americans. And but I don't want to end this section without explicitly honoring the humanity of Sarah Bartman because I feel like she's often only talked about in terms of her exploitation. But so I don't want to end on that. Um, and remember how I said earlier that Sarah Bartman was not laid to rest in her homeland until 2002? Um, well, one of the most influential acts of protest and cultural work that propelled her rematriation forward was a 1998 poem by Diana Ferris, who's a Black South African poet and storyteller. So we're gonna close out this section by listening to Diana recite this tribute to Sarah Bartman. I've come to take you home, a tribute to Sarah Bartman. I've come to take you home, home. Do you remember the felt, the lush green grass beneath the big oak trees? The air is cool there and the sun does not burn. I have made your bed, at the foot of the hill, your blankets are covered in buchu and mint. The proteas stand in yellow and white, and the water in the stream chuckles, sing songs as it hobbles along over little stones. I've come to wrench you away, away from the poking eyes of the man-made monster who lives in the dark with his clutches of imperialism who dissects your body bit by bit, who likens your soul to that of Satan and declares himself the ultimate God. I've come to soothe your heavy heart. I offer my bosom to your weary soul. I will cover your face with the palms of my hands. Run my lips over the lines in your neck. Feast my eyes on the beauty of you and I will sing for you, for I have come to bring you peace. I've come to take you home where the ancient mountains shout your name. I have made your bed at the foot of the hill. Your blankets are covered in buchu and mint. The proteas stand in yellow and white. I've come to take you home where I will sing for you, for you have brought me peace, for you have brought us peace. Yeah, I feel like there's not much to say after that. That tribute is so, so beautiful to me. Um, watching it, and you know, it's deeply rooted in the experience of a black woman reaching out to another black woman across history, time and space to rebuke the harm being committed against her. Like watching that actually really propel propels me forward um, to our next and final section on black feminist resistance. I think that it's really critical for all folks globally, especially those in the United States to learn more about the historical ways in which gender intersects with race and blackness. In this past year alone, we've seen so much anti-trans le legislation targeting trans youth in the United States. We've seen it moving forward. We've seen the ongoing murders of black trans women and the dismantling of legal abortion protections by the US Supreme Court. So let's start by defining the major system of oppression that knits all of these injustices together, patriarchy. So thank you, anti-Blackness and patriarchy have a long and interconnected history. And these, these systems continue to prop one another up to this day. I define patriarchy as an ongoing, I'm uh, sorry, an impressive social and political system that is perpetuated through discriminatory policies, laws, sentiments, and practices in which cisgender heterosexual men hold primarily so, primary socioeconomic power, authority, control and privilege over people of marginalized genders, cis and trans women, trans men and non-binary people, all trans people actually. 
For the purposes of today's conversation in which we'll be centering Blackness, we will be focusing on how gender oppression is a racialized experience in a particular form of a in a particular form of patriarchy known as misogynoir. Misogynoir can be defined as the unique race and gender-based violence that Black cis and trans women and girls face in the United States. And of course, there are nuances to hold in this conversation because some trans and non-binary people may experience misogynoir too. As a Black non-binary person myself, like I sit in this nuance. So I'll also be using Black people of marginalized genders like when appropriate throughout this conversation as well. So dating back to chattel slavery and settler colonialism, the creation of harmful stereotypes like the Mammy, the Jezebel, and Sapphire, and other forms of dehumanization were used against Black people of marginalized genders to justify the sexual and physical, abu physical abuse that they have historically endured. And to be real, under slavery, Black people really did not have any self-determined gender identity. As property, under white Christian slave owners, Black people were forced onto the two-gender binary of either man or woman, for the purposes of reproduction, but still did not have any real rights or recognition of humanity. So these stereotypes that I'm going to explain were directed at people thrown into the category of Black women. Um, so just keep in mind that while Black people have always found ways to subvert and resist patriarchy, the ability to self-determine your own gender was really, really difficult for hundreds of years. So first we'll get into the mammy stereotype. Um, I know it's a bit small, but the photo is from the 1939 film. The photo at the top is from the 1939 film, Gone with the Wind. Um, the mammy stereotype is often imagined as a fat, darker skinned black woman who is completely desexualized. The mammy figure is often portrayed as like happy, jolly, per perfectly content about her role as the caretaker of the white family, especially white children, being a cook uh, or a wet nurse to them. This stereotype in movies like Gone with the Wind showcased to me just how much like white women have been not only complicit, but active in the racist subjugation of black people of marginalized genders by enthusiastically using the labor of enslaved black women and girls in their homes domestically. Um, also, we have the Jezebel stereotype. Um, it's a stereotype that black women and girls are hypersexual, lustful, temptress figures this stereotype is really patriarchal and also very slut shamey to black women and girls that embrace and self-determine their own sexualities. And for this photo here, it's of this sort of like Jezebel-like ashtray. I found this image um, in the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Memorabilia. Like this is a black figure that's topless wearing like a grass skirt. I'm assuming that like some white man probably owned this, unfortunately. This stereotype in particular has been used to justify sexual violence against Black women and girls. Historically, under slavery, it wasn't considered a crime to sexually assault Black people. That's just the reality. Like, research studies have also shown that Black girls are seen culturally as less innocent and more adult-like than white girls, their peers. And like, this stereotype continues today in the ways that Black people of marginalized genders are hyper-vulnerable to high rates of sexual abuse and intimate partner violence. And lastly, we have the sapphire stereotype. Um, this stereotype paints black women and girls as angry, aggressive, sassy, bitter, mad, and as the emasculators of cis black men. And the cartoon at the bottom is also from the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Memorabilia. And it shows this really racist caricature of a black woman, I guess like, after hitting her partner with a rolling pin, like this, this is messed up, it's fucked. This stereotype really tries to push the idea uh, that black people of marginalized genders are undeserving of protection. It also helps silence them. Like the fear of being labeled as an angry or difficult to work with black woman can keep you from speaking out against injustice committed against you. Um, and so while all these three cultural stereotypes help justify sexual and physical abuse, also the dehumanization of black people of marginalized genders was built into discriminatory laws and practices carried out by the white supremacist state, like Jim Crow, lynching, segregation, mass incarceration, and police brutality. I say this because state violence against black people is often talked about primarily in the context of violence against cis black men only. The histories of black people of marginalized genders who experience state violence are in many ways rendered invisible. And it's not to say that there haven't been attempts by Black women in particular 
to shine a light on violence against Black people of marginalized genders. So Ida B. Wells, for example, she was an investigative journalist and one of the co-founders of the NAACP. She reported on the lynchings of Black women in the South by white people. They, she's often only talked about as reporting the lynchings of Black men, but she also was very clear of the intersections of race and gender violence um, that Black women experience in the South. There's also Rosa Parks. She's well known for not giving up her seat on a segregated bus in 1955, but rarely is her background as a trained organizer and investigator in the NAACP talked about. Like she was also specifically an investigator of sexual assault against black people in the NAACP. In the 1940s in Alabama, she co-created an organization dedicated to supporting and defending black women and girl survivors of sexual assault at the hands of cis men. And today we also have coalitions in like the In Our Names Network, uh, which is working to document and end police violence against Black people of marginalized genders. So also to say overall, over the past 400 plus years, 500 of white racial hierarchy, the gender identities of Black folks across the globe have been heavily policed, fetishized, disregarded, and unaffirmed. Okay, so I love Bell Hooks. I had to bring her into the space. Um, as I feel that she perfectly articulates in this excerpt from Ain't I a Woman, Black Women and Feminism, the difference between Black feminist resistance and the more mainstream wealthy cis white feminism. And I think, can I ask Colin to read this out loud? I think you're the last person. Me, feminism is not simply a struggle to end male chauvinism or a movement to ensure that women will have equal rights with men. It is a commitment to eradicating the ideology of domination that permeates Western culture on various levels, gender, race, class, to name a few, and a commitment to reorganizing U.S. society so that the self-development of people can take precedence over imperialism, economic expansion, and material desires. It's from our favorite bell hooks, Ain't I a Woman, Black Women and Feminism. Thank you so much. So in so many ways, white feminists have invested themselves in trying to get the same equal rights as white cisgender men to be capitalists and exploiters too, um, utilizing white racial hierarchy against black people broadly and particularly against black people of marginalized genders. But black radical feminists often experiencing life as poor, black and marginalized by their gender have had different stakes and needed to create feminist practices that pushed for an end of domination and hierarchy in all forms, and into patriarchy, white supremacy, capitalism, imperialism, and so on. So now I wanna uplift a few ways in which black people of marginalized genders, whether they identified as feminists or not, resisted patriarchy. Through these examples, I hope to make clear to you all that there's a black radical feminist tradition that has shown up multiple times throughout the history of the United States, the so-called United States. Um, so first I'll start with Celia. Celia was a 19 year old enslaved young black woman in Missouri, um, the state known as Missouri, who killed her master in 1855 after surviving five years of sexual abuse. Her lawyer's defense was that she should be protected by a Missouri law that allowed women to use deadly force as self-defense against violence. But the reality is that Celia as an enslaved black girl was not viewed as a woman in the eyes of Missouri state law. Because of this, the judge declared her guilty of murder and sentenced her to death by hanging, which happened in, on December 21st, 1855. There is no happy ending to her story, but I still find it really important to honor her name as so many of the stories of enslaved Black girls, women, trans, and gender nonconforming people resisting racist and patriarchal violence have been lost to us. So I'm grateful to know and honor her resistance. Next, we have Marsha P. Johnson, who is a Black trans woman, organizer, sex worker, and one of the stewards of the gay liberation movement. She's also a founding member of the radical gay and trans liberation organization called STAR, Street Trans Action Revolutionaries in New York. So STAR explicitly centered young, unhoused, poor, queer and trans folks, um, also Black and Latinx folks as well, many of whom were sex workers as well. Um, Marsha P. Johnson's practice as a Black woman was to organize around the needs of Black and Latinx, queer and trans folks in New York City 
who were pushed to the margins of the mainstream gay liberation movement that centered around, and I would argue still centers around, white middle-class gay cisgender men. So, and finally, we're gonna end on the Kambahi River Collective. The Kambahi River Collective was an organization in the 1970s made up of working class black lesbian feminists who were also socialists. The collective formed out of a need for a feminism that did not ignore anti-blackness, that did not ignore homophobia, and a feminism that explicitly wanted to see an end to class exploitation and capitalism. In 1979, there had been a string of murders of black women and girls in the Roxbury neighborhood of Boston that was given very little press and or media attention. The Kambahi River Collective worked to raise awareness by circulating a pamphlet they wrote with safety and protection tips and mobilized hundreds of community members in Boston in April of 1979 for a rally and memorial of those murdered black women and girls. The Kambahi River Collective also wrote a powerful statement clarifying their politics that shifted the way many of us think of black, about black feminism today. It pushed forward the idea of interlocking oppressions, kind of like sort of how we think about intersectionality today and also identity politics, which is really, really misinterpreted today. So identity politics is often used today to reduce people down to their identities and treat marginalized people as like inherently radical. For example, you know, it was wild. People were saying that, oh, it's radical that we have a black woman vice president. Um, but that's not what the Kambahi River Collective meant. Like they did not envision a black woman leading settler colonial empire. That was not it. Um, so identity politics as actually theorized by the Kambahi River Collective is about the right of marginalized people to create political agendas, policy platforms, whatever, that address the realities of their lives. In the collective's case, creating a political agenda rooted in the material needs of black lesbian feminists in the 1970s. So with all of that in mind, I find, next slide please. Thank you. So with all of this in mind, I find myself being able to say this statement with ease that black radical feminists in the so-called United States organizing against anti-black anti -black racism, patriarchy, transphobia, homophobia, capitalism, and a host of other systems of oppression have broadly and definitively, definitively shaped contemporary feminist thought. So as someone who comes out of a tradition of organizing via black queer abolitionist feminism, I can say without a doubt that the lives of black women radicals like Celia, Marsha P. Johnson, the woman who made up the Kambahi River Collective and Bell Hooks directly influenced the work, my work, and also the work of other black feminists today. Okay, so thank you all for hanging out with me and being so willing to listen to me over the course of this presentation. Now we're gonna wrap up and I will leave you all with some final thoughts from me. So, by viewing anti-Blackness as a system of oppression that operates beyond just white racial hierarchy, but it's also critical to the development of other systems of systemic violence, like settler colonialism, fat phobia, and patriarchy, you know, what we talked about today, we are more likely to have a sharpened analysis of how we get free collectively. To paraphrase Bell Hooks, learning, exper learning experiences like today are how you deepen your understanding of the knitting together of parts. Learning how anti-Blackness bleeds into all other parts of everyday life in the United States is how you train your mind to move forward and make more connections in other scenarios and instances. So hopefully this workshop will aid your coalition building and movement work to come. Also, this class only dives deeper into a few social issues. Like there are a multitude of other axes of oppression that can be examined through the lens of Black liberation like ableism and disability justice, algorithms, climate justice, food sovereignty, like you name it. So, you know, maybe there'll be a part three, who knows? But anyway, thank you all so much. And hopefully we have a bit of time left for a and a Thank you so much, Maya. Um, I would like to encourage everyone to put your questions in Q&A. Uh, I know this was a very um, rich presentation. There's a lot of concepts. If you have not read the documentation that is referred here, we will make sure you get your hands on them. 
after the class. And of course, I will let Nicole conclude with Maya. I'm just jumping in to say thank you. Thank you, Celine. I was having a little bit of technical issues coming back to the Zoom, but Maya, thank you so much for an amazing class as always. And who knows if there will be a part three? We know that there will be a part three because there is we love you. definitely a part three. I have to like the executive decision over here. Yeah, we know there will be a part three. <laughs> thank you all so much. And thank, thank you so much you. to the interpreters as well, all the tech. Always. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm going to jump into the q and um, I'm going to read people's names if that's all right. But Tanya is asking, um, regarding fat phobia, how do we spread awareness for how it isn't rooted in wellness? Considering the medical field and wellness companies perpetuate it, the argument I usually give is someone can seem fit, but actually be unhealthy. And they may, for example, they may work out a lot, but eat an unbalanced diet, for example, and wondering how else to go deeper. So... One, I really appreciate that question. One, I definitely recommend reading um, the Fearing the Black Body, The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia, because I think that it just like so well, it so just explains so well the history of anti-fatness and how it's inherently connected to anti-Black racism. There's also a few other books that I will recommend in my further reading. Honestly, for me, I don't love the argument of, oh, like skinny people can be unhealthy too. Because for me, I see fat liberation as being inherently in solidarity and very closely connected to disability justice. So part of the reason why I think we should avoid just talking about health is because that still implies that like health is a determinant of your value in society, where I think it shouldn't matter if you're healthy or not. Because the reality is like a lot of the people with a lot of money in this world are not healthy. It, it just should not matter. It should never matter. Like, you know, also because these ideas of health, who gets to determine like what is healthy and what is not, who get like all of those, like pr the parameters around health to me feel very much so still determined by white supremacy. And so personally for me, I just, I usually just say like, why, that, why should it matter? Like, why should someone's worth like be limited or like, you know, disregarded because of their health. Um, and so even like the argument of like, oh, Lizzo's a vegan, or like Lizzo works out a lot. I'm just like, there are fat people who don't work out a lot. There are fat people who aren't vegan and their life still matters too. Like it should not, you know what I'm saying? Like it should not be invested in health because it's, there's still that implication that people who aren't healthy don't deserve life, don't, de don't deserve dignity, don't deserve to be here. Um, yeah, so that's what I think. <laughs> so well said. So well said on so many levels. A, it doesn't matter. B, like if people are going to talk about health, then are you going to talk about like like environmental racism? Are you going to talk about like how like how polluted things are? Are you talking about food sovereignty? Are you going to talk about all the many other factors that have made health kind of a luxury or an impossibility even? Yeah, I yeah. thanks, Maya. Really, um, Esma is asking: Do you think mainstream feminist movements in the United States and abroad are starting to adopt ideas from Black radical feminists and listening to definitions such as the quote from Bell Hooks, or do you think we still have a long way to go? Big question. <laughs> yeah, that is a big question. I think in some ways, also, it's weird because I. I personally don't really see myself as like connected with mainstream feminism. I'm very explicitly like I'm a black feminist. Like I am like very much so interested in learning primarily from black feminists of the African diaspora. Um, I'm not sure if any of you know, but there's this Instagram, like also website and platform called Black Women Radicals that actually has a very amazing just like archive yes. of black women radicals from Africa, the Americas, like honestly, like all parts of the world and also hosts like workshops and like, it's like a school for black feminist politics. Um, so I definitely recommend checking that out. Yes, thank you, thank you for putting it in the chat. Um, and yeah, so I think for me, I feel like I'm maybe not the one who should be answering that question. I do think though, in some ways I can say that like these ideas of the knitting together of parts, intersectionality, interlocking oppressions, um, that have historically, I feel like, 
to be frank, have come out of Black feminisms or Black radical women, Black radical people, marginalized genders who've been thinking about gender. Like that does feel mainstreamed, absolutely. Um, I think in many ways, I would say that like some of these ideas of like recognizing that like more than one system of, system of oppression can affect a person's life at one time, that feels mainstreamed. I don't know so much everything else. I, feel, I still think what I little, I pay attention to in mainstream feminism, there's still a lot of capitalism um, and not enough denouncing of imperialism and all like those other systems of oppression that affect the lives of people of marginalized genders. Mm. <sighs> very thoughtful answer thank you Maya um we have a question actually from the SF team so uh I was recently in a space of supposed allies who came together to work on a core issue immigration and we had a moment of anti-blackness from a non-black person of color knowing it's exhausting to both constantly fight for our humanity while also while also uplifting other communities of color, how do we as Black folks navigate existing in these spaces while knowing that this is also true? That's oh, that is a really good question. Yeah. And I actually, I really struggle with that because I have noticed that in immigration spaces, I feel like I, even part one, I think I spoke a bit to how Black immigrants are like, Black migrants in particular, are like kind of just sidelined um, in discussions of immigration in the United States in particular. I, I don't know. I think that I really don't know the answer to that fully. I think for me, if I was in that position and like, and I have been in that position before, I've often like, I guess been the like, the like critical person in the room who's just like, we actually have to talk about this, but also it's not fair. It's really not fair for black people to have to constantly be the ones to like name that like you cannot be anti-black and still expect solidarity. Um, I guess this, my answer is a call for non-black people to skill up and like learn more so that it's not just on the black people in the room to name when anti-blackness is present. Um, yeah, skill up. Heard. <laughs> yeah, Kenrick is asking, and this is kind of going back to um, our notions of anti-Blackness and fat phobia. So how do we break out of the paradox of fat phobia in that food desert swamps or low income neighborhood littered with unhealthy, cheap food options create a condition of health and wellness that is not sustainable for consumers or citizens, but the working model for food corps and grocers at large? Mm. I think that's a that's a tough one for me because I think that I I feel like in some ways like fat people in particular are really scapegoated or like put into a position as being blamed for like overconsumption in the United States or just like seen inherently as like negative beings um, and I think also like they're I think that what when I say like medical fat phobia, I think that in many ways, for example, like some of the food, I guess like food consumption similarities between like poor white people and poor black communities are the same, but still there's like worse health outcomes and worse medical care for like poor black people. And to me, I think that Primarily what I want us to focus around is how do we make sure that like doctors are providing not non-fat phobic care. Like mm -hmm. I didn't even get into it in this presentation, but there are doctors who will not take appointments for you if you're over a certain body mass index BMI, like, you know, whatever. Like it's true. Like they will openly not, if you need a specialist and like this literally happened to a friend of mine like a few weeks ago, like they will not take appointments for you. So I think that like I am more deeply concerned about health care, like care that actually, not act, fat people actually getting the care that they need. I think I'm less concerned with shaming people about their food choices. Like I want people to have more diverse food choices. I want like people to have the ability to self-determine whatever foods they want. Like I want like there to be communities with all types of food instead of just shaming and saying like, oh, food swamps, food deserts. Like, let's focus more on like getting all types of food in communities, but also at the same time, I want us to like, less, like let's focus on the morality of whether food is healthy or not, because food is an anatomic object and like can't really, you know, be seen as like 
good or bad. Like a donut is a donut. Sorry. <laughs> um, but I want us to focus more on getting these doctors to stop being fat phobic. Like take my appointment, like take appointments for fat people. Like make sure that the healthcare is there. Stop being racist and fat phobic. And like, yes, like also food sovereignty to the point that like people can choose to eat whatever, whatever they want. Like I have all food options in front of them. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that explains. That was super helpful. Cause I think also like it's, yeah, as you said, it's really important to think about um, like people having self-determining like for what they eat, but also it's like at the end of the day, people still deserve healthcare. People still deserve to like not not to have to care <laughs> about what they eat and like be treated any differently for it. So thank you for like these eye-opening moments and like that perspective that like at the end of the day it's still fat phobic to like deny somebody healthcare or like yeah you're amazing um barbara's asking when was your aha moment that motivated you to become an activist in these matters i really admire your candor and every statement and as a latina i'm trying to walk the same pathway oh thank you barbara um i what was my aha moment i don't know if i necessarily had one I think that for me, it might have just been like my lived reality. It's like being black, queer, non-binary, the child of West African West African immigrants, like all of those things I think coalesced to like me sort of always having an interest in social justice. Um, I think that going to college and like meeting a collective of prison abolitionists and doing more political education to connect my lived experience to the sort of structural that maybe that was my aha moment, like starting political education and realizing like, oh, like my experience is not simply an individual experience. Like it is connected to greater systemic forces at hand that need to be dismantled. Um, so I think for me, if there's any possibility for you to like be able to like be in study with other study circles, book clubs, any sort of form of political education with others, I think that that really helps like, you know, uh, make these connections like more visible to you like it just I don't know being in community with others hearing other people's thoughts continues for me to like help I guess like enrich my brain to make me sharper have a more sophisticated analysis thank you oh joy asks since the media is another portrayer of fat phobia the recent movie with the actor that won an Oscar wearing a fat suit, for instance, how can we push against the media to change the harmful narrative? Yep, I know what film you're talking about, The Whale, which also is so sick to me. Like, you literally call a movie starring a fat person The Whale. Like, okay, I, my thing is, first of all, I didn't watch that movie, but I read a lot of reviews of it. I don't love talking too much about things that I don't know, but from what I can say, my immediate thought, oh, it won, an, it won the makeup award. Wow. Now, that I found actually really fat phobic and it's slapping the face to fat people. Yeah. They could say that like his fat suit is Oscar. Hmm. Anyway, y'all, I think bare minimum, I don't want to see any more fat suits in media. No more fat suits, abolish fat suits. If you want yeah. to do a movie, first of all, if you're gonna do a movie on fat people, it needs to be a movie, movie that's humane, that doesn't just portray fat people as like pitiable characters. I guess they're mm -hmm. like in the house all the time. But also like, I wanna see like a fat person who's actually 400, 500, 600 pounds taking like a role that's like treats them with dignity. Cause I'm like, there are like so many fat actors that are not getting these roles, like any yeah. role. Like there's so many roles in which people portray like fat suits, like wearing fat suits that could go to actual fat actors. Um, having more fat people in the writing room as well. Like there's so few shows um, that portray fat people with dignity um, or like fat main characters. But yeah, I'm like, if folks wanna like put any like options, like really good representation that they see in the chat, I would love to know off the top of your head. Um, but yeah, abolish fat suits. <laughs> For real. I'm not, yeah, I'm like, I'm not even watching that movie. I'm like. No. Mm -mm. Uh. Henrik is also asking on the topic of fat phobic healthcare, to what extent do you see American medicine pivoting away from the white male as the ideal patient slash body? Um, Thank you. I, I, I guess I'm a little pessimistic right now, Kendrick. I, I don't really see it pivoting way much. 
Um, I think that I've, well, a bit, like I've seen in part because of the activism of fat people, critical fat scholars, um, like Sabrina Strings, Deshaun Harrison, like there's been a few examples of people critiquing the medical system. But I think overall, the fact that like, I can still, or a friend of mine can still like get denied an appointment that they need because their BMI is too high like that. I just see we're, we're not there yet. The US is really struggling. Mm-hmm. And I think to be frank, like fat phobia is in particular so rampant in the United States because it's so tied to anti-blackness. Um, and I think the reason also why I brought up Lizzo, for example, is because although like there, of course there are other fat black, fat women, but I feel like Lizzo in particular as a fat black woman gets the most hate and vitriol than any other fat musician, celebrities or entertainers. I like think that people really need to understand that blackness is like this enhancing factor of fatness um, that like is it's this particular, that violence is particular. Um, so yeah, I'm a little pessimistic, but like there are like some doctors that are pushing back on fat phobia who like, and we'll say it's very few and far in between. I don't, I'm not so much talking about the health at every size, but there are some actual doctors who like won't weigh you when you first walk into a room who like actually see fat people as humans, but like it's just a limited number. Um, and I have to do some research because I think they have, there's like some lists of like fat, non fat phobic doctors like on the internet. Yeah. I, I'm also kind of pessimistic, like just because anti blackness is really rampant in, not just the way that they treat like fat patients, but also it's like, even if you go in for like a skin thing, like everybody's very used to only treating like white skin as the default. So like, you have, like it kind of puts this, like a lot of pressure on the patient because now if you're like melanated in any way, you have to ask for like certain things because it's like, could like burn you. Yeah. So it's, like, really kind of scary. And it's like a way to like punish anybody who's not like the dominating white body exactly because medicine like people i don't think realize that so many modes of medicine that we consider modern medicine are inherently come out of race science like all of these like gynecology like Mm -hmm. the the body mass index that is still used by the world health organization like so much of modern medicine and like just some of these i guess like social sciences even like anthropology like all of this stuff comes out of like white europeans trying to categorize humans and like create a white racial hierarchy like i don't i don't think that people really really understand that the medical field today is just like inherently rooted or trying to now course correct on pseudoscience for a lot of it say that maya yeah yeah um Oh, here we go. Tanya is asking, should we focus on other ways of healthy living then? Um, like holistic medicine, herbal remedies. I'm not sure if these are better regarding in the systems that they're rooted in. Hmm. I think that it's difficult for me because I feel like I, I wonder still if like us using those like alternatives, like might still like replicate this hierarchy of like who's healthy and who is not and treat people who fail at like you know treatment or fail to do well like with these I guess like holistic practices like still treat them horribly I think that I'm more invested in just like instead of health care like the aspect of care like that language feels really important to me of like how do we make sure that like someone like has autonomy over their being is able to like live as long as they want to and like not deny whatever treatments they want or that they decide um and always prioritizing the needs the specific needs of like each patient or each person that needs care um but I don't know I'm not necessarily like I'm not like a healthcare professional like there are actually like fat doctors who are I think would be um better to answer that question but it's Mm -hmm. making me think more I just want to also time check us because it's 1.20 and I know we could go on, which is why we're going to have a part three. (laughs) 
<laughs> but um, I just want to say also to the person who asked, yes, we will have the slides accessible. Um, I would say wait within one to two weeks. We'll have the full part two up and live on our website. Um, if someone wants to drop it in the chat, it's just slowfactory.com slash open edu. You can also catch part one of Maya's class there as well, which is really, really amazing and foundational and um a great rewatch if you if it's been a while or a great follow-up to this class if you're tuning in for the first time. Also, um Slow Factory is um we rely on public donations. So if you are able, if 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 please go ahead and um and donate. We appreciate it and we always make the most of every donation and you know, it's like, you know, multiplying the fishes. We'll, we'll, you know, we will feed, we'll feed the masses. Exactly. But Maya, thank you so much. And also PS stay tuned because Maya is also a Slow Factory fellow. So they're going to be doing a deep dive into more research about how we can all get free by looking at anti-blackness and how None of us can get free unless Black liberation is at the forefront of that movement. Absolutely. Maya, thank you so much. Also, give them a follow at Savage X Fatty on IG. Um, thank you all so much. Yes, this will be up in a couple of weeks. We appreciate you so much. And Maya, thank yeah. you so much, as always. Thank you so much, this little factory team. I appreciate you all. Thank you for reading out this quote. Of course. And thank you to our ASL interpreters. We appreciate y'all so much. Thank you, Richard, Richard and Shahrazad. Thank you both so much. Bye, everyone.